human nature wants evidence for God. This tree over my shoulder, I can use deductive reasoning to prove that a tree over my shoulder is there. I can prove its chemical components, its physical attributes, its size, its color, etc. I can prove that two and two equals four. But these kinds of things aren't nearly as important as proving whether or not there is a God. So why is it that in this world, well, the things that don't really matter, we can prove with hard physical evidence or with deductive reasoning. But for something as important as eternity, something as important as salvation, something as important as whether or not there is a God, why can't I use the same sorts of deductive reasoning methods to arrive at God? Well, this is where faith comes in. We can prove that God is there through other forms of reasoning. For one thing, we do have faith, and we have the Word of God, which is central, as I've mentioned earlier, to everything that exists in this universe. But there are also indications on subjects like salvation, subjects like mercy, subjects like eternity, subjects, the subject of God, that I can use, I can use a longing that is within my own soul, the longing that you have in your soul. That vacuum that Blas Pascal described, that God-shaped vacuum that you have, that emptiness, an emptiness that is extraordinarily creative because it causes us to look beyond creation to try to fill this void that's within our soul. We try everything in the world. It's been tried before. It doesn't work. Solomon described it this way. All the rivers run into the sea, and yet the sea is not full. You may have wondered why I was pointing at my heart when I said all the rivers run into the sea. It's because he's using a metaphor for human existence. A river is something he's using metaphorically for riches, for pleasure, for notoriety, for talent, for fame. These are all rivers that flow into the sea of his soul. And yet he discovered the sea is still not full. And he was a man that was extraordinarily wealthy and he's tried everything that you might be trying right now to try to fill the void. Whatever your plans are, let me assure you, they have been thought before, they have been followed before, and at the end of that road is more emptiness if you're trying to satisfy the soul with things of the world. And so, it's the very emptiness of the world, in spite of all of its wonder, in spite of all of its satisfaction, in spite of all that it offers, still, the human being is somehow not satisfied. And it is that very lack of satisfaction, that very lack of final peace and contentment that is our greatest indication that there's an answer beyond the world, something that fills our soul beyond it. So how about you? What right now are you thinking of that's going to fill the void? What are you planning right now? What, what plans are you laying? Is it gonna be in the career? That's important, but it isn't the end game. Is it even that person that you love very much? Is it important? as he or she is, you'll find that if you try to make that person take the place of God in your life, you're going to do great harm to that person and to yourself. It's not a strong enough of a gravity point, not strong enough gravity there to hold in orbit all that your soul needs. May I suggest to you that of all of God's creations, pointing us towards him, perhaps his greatest creation is not something, but a nothing.
an emptiness, a profound loneliness. What if God created an emptiness to lead you to him? I was a youth pastor for many years and I found it odd that one of the most common prayers that I heard youth pray was that God would wait until at least the day after their honeymoon to come back. Hold off on the rapture, God, for at least the day after I get married. It's so funny and so strange at once, but also so easy to understand if there's a misconception about what God is like and about what heaven is like. Now it's beyond my ability to be able to describe heaven. We already have that in John's Gospel. And what John has to say is a little bit limited. We're going to have to find out most of what's over there once we get over there. However, the more important point, I think, is that the Bible doesn't describe heaven as some kind of an eternal church service in which we all sing songs, play drums, play the organ, play the keyboard, and listen to sermon after sermon after sermon for an eternity. And I think that might be why sometimes I hear young people wanting to hold off on the rapture until at least the honeymoon, or sometimes even expressing doubt as to the wonder of heaven, or wanting to go to heaven. They want to go to heaven because they don't want to go to hell. It's the only alternative. Well, that's, again, probably based upon a very poor perception of what heaven is like. Suppose we have a young man in love with a beautiful young lady. He wants to wait. He wants heaven to wait. Because for him, she's heaven. She has this way. Whenever she's there, his heart beats a little faster. Whenever she's gone, he feels like something's been torn away from him. He can hardly imagine his life without her. The scent of her as she walks by. The color of her eyes. The sound of her laugh. Everything absolutely thrills him about her. He understandably assumes that she is the very embodiment of heaven herself. He can't imagine that there could be a heaven higher than her, his heaven. Well, let's take a step back for a moment. The book of James says, every good and perfect gift comes from above and descends from the Father of lights in whom there is no change or shadow of turning. What this young man needs to understand is to take a step back for a moment and consider if she is that wonderful, if she is that beautiful, if she can make him feel completely sick when she's gone, if she can make him thrill whenever she's there, imagine how much more wonderful her creator is. She is merely a creation. She's merely something that the creator made. And so everything that's wonderful about her is infinitely more wonderful about him because he, God, invented her. Now that's what we have to do oftentimes with this world. We have to understand that everything we see, everything we feel, everything we experience, especially when it's good, when it's true, and when it's beautiful, is coming from God, the Father of lights, 
and that whatever we do experience, we're experiencing at a thousand removes from God. But one day, when we step into eternity, we are no longer going to experience the good and the true and the beautiful from all of these removes as separated as we are from heaven and earth. We are going to come to the very fount, the very fount of everything that's good, everything true, everything that's beautiful. We will be experiencing God no longer at a distance and no longer just through other creations like the woman that I described a little while ago. We will experience God himself, completely unfiltered, completely untainted by our own experiences. And that really is what is so wonderful about this world. This world leads us to God. This world is like a matchmaker between us and God, leading us to Him. If this can be so wonderful, if she can be so wonderful, how much more wonderful the Creator. And so, like the detective who looks for a culprit by tracing the fingerprint back to the finger, so is the world this kind of fingerprint of God through which we trace everything back to God himself.